Hi, it's John McGrady, and I'm here for our first in the interview with the Statistician series. And it's an honor and a privilege to have today the Hurley Durier Chairwoman of the Department of Biostatistics at the Bloomberg School, Dr. Karen Bandine Roche. Welcome, Karen. It's a wonderful to be here, John. Excellent, excellent. So Karen's been the chair of the department for four years and has a great vision for the current and future of statistics. And I wonder if you could sort of share a couple of the big challenges and opportunities in statistics here in the year 2012? Well, I think one of the things on many people's minds is big data. You hear it everywhere from the White House to the various science magazines and um, other places. And so that's a clear challenge for statistics, dealing with and making sense of volumes of data mm -hmm. that we haven't seen until recent times. Um, but I, I firmly believe that there are many other areas of statistics that remain at play. And so, for instance, um, we still need to understand and distinguish causes from mere associations, things just going together without being causally related. I, I believe that as we understand physiology better, um, some interesting parametric models will come into play. So new ways of actually um, developing equations and, and models to describe physiological and other health phenomena. Um, and, and then, of course, very important applications across the spectrum in a school like ours, all the way from social science where things can be very challenging to measure to applications like genomics which are in, in such high profile these days and uh, imaging and other areas where one deeply has to understand the nature of measurement uh, to begin to make progress. So it's a rich, rich era for statistics Very exciting right now. time, right? It's the sexy time to be a data Absolutely. scientist or statistician, right? It According couldn't be sexier. So Karen, you know, you've done many things in your statistical career, um, but you've made great contributions to the world of statistical modeling, and it's sort of manifested itself substantively in different areas, and including environmental health, the science of aging, um, and neurology. So I wanted to ask you, you know, this is a basic foundations of biostatistics course. You know, we're going to be doing some of the greatest hits of biostatistics, thinking about the methods, the study designs, the inferences we can make from the evidence at hand, both statistically and scientifically. And we're going to be starting from first principles like exploratory data analysis and the basics of statistical inference. How important are techniques like that to the work that you do? Well, they're absolutely critical, and I, I find myself building up probably in roughly the same order that you'll build up in this course. Exploratory data analysis being crucial if you don't know what your data look like to uh, be a little bit facile about it. One, it's very difficult to ascertain whether one's analyses are representing reality or mm -hmm. just the statistical models that one is using. Um, I imagine that virtually all of the methods that individuals will be learning in this course will be useful to them in some way, whether it's reading the literature, whether it is um, later on learning to perform more analyses, very crucially in collaborating with statisticians. Um, I think that's one thing that I've found, found as a thread running through my work all the way through, but increasingly much, is interdisciplinarity, where uh, in today's science, it can be very difficult to make headway in a single discipline alone. Rather, it's large teams uh, collaborating, and so this course will give students crucial tools in being able to work with statisticians and other quantitative scientists in uh, whatever fields they happen to be interested in. Great, great. So, you know, some students in the course might be saying, well, you know, I'm not a statistician. I'm not going to be a statistician. I may not even work with statisticians. Uh, what do you think the benefit of someone like that can get out of a course like this? Well, I'm going to divert a little bit just to give my idea of what mm -hmm. statistics is and then come back to your question. So um, I think of statistics as the science of understanding data that are, carry a major component of variability and uncertainty. If you think about it, that's virtually all of the data that mm -hmm. we encounter in public health and, and, and medicine. And so unless an individual were to say, I'm really not interested in public health or medical data, um, it, it's a little bit inconceivable to me that statistics would not at least enrich their thinking uh, about designing studies with such data or um, just being a, an informed consumer of the science around them, whether it be to inform investigation that they'll be doing or even to, um, to do clinical work and that sort of thing at the cutting edge level. Great. 
So in the second part of this course, we're going to spend a lot of time on multivariable regression models, linear, logistic, and timed event or Cox proportional hazard. A lot of your work is sort of built on the basis that we're going to set up here. And if you would, you know, one of Karen's very big areas of contribution is called latent variable modeling. I wonder if you could give us the, you know, two to five sentence description, if it's possible, as to what latent variable modeling is and how it relates to regression. And two to five sentences was kind of a joke. I mean, <laughs> however, however you want to play this out. But, you know, I just didn't want to keep you here too long. You know. I'll, I'll give it a try. And so those other regression methods that you have just mentioned will have to do with relating a health outcome of interest, you know, whether it be disease, yes, no, or measured health aspect like blood pressure or, or other things to predictors, risk factors, environmental determinants, that sort of thing. So, so that's regression. What latent variable models do is to say, okay, now suppose that the outcome cannot be observed directly. Mm. Rather, the best that we can do is to infer it imprecisely through multiple surrogate measures, each of which get at what you're really trying to measure, but don't capture it fully or precisely. So in, in my own area of aging, a good example is geriatric frailty. Mm. Uh, physicians know it when they see it. Each person listening to this interview probably can imagine a frail older person if I, if I ask them to do so. But then how do you quantify a person's frailty, their degree of frailty. Um, latent variable models can be useful in linking um, what it is that's known or hypothesized to uh, imprecise uh, or indirect measures of frailty that really have to be synthesized to get at the whole Excellent. So age itself is not just a number then. Thank you. I, like I, the way I would say no. Okay, excellent, excellent. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, wonderful. Well, it's been a Great pleasure having you here today, and I know the students and I really appreciate your coming time, taking the time to talk to us, and I look forward to working with you over the next year in the context of the Department of Biostatistics, and again, thank you very much. John, thank you so much. It just couldn't be a better time to be learning about statistics. Thanks, Karen.